Can I just balls? They don't look like a ball. That's right, we're talking about subatomic particles. Hit the theme. Ain't nothing but a chem thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break it. this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shu Fu Coming At Ya. I'm your host, Fu, and with me as always is Shu. Shu know it. So in the last episode, we talked about the Greeks and their contribution in philosophy to atomic theory. And we continued with Boyle and Lavoisier and talked about how chemistry was developed. And we ended with John Dalton and his hard sphere model. Today we're going to dig a little bit deeper and find out what was discovered to be contained within an atom. Let's get started. Atomic History Part 2. The epic saga continues. Subatomic Particles, a lesson from the Atomic Theory Unit. J.J. Thompson, British physicist, 1856 to 1940. Experiments. He experimented with cathode ray tubes, or CRTs for short, in which an electric current was run between metal electrodes through a glass tube with a low pressure gas. So cathode ray tubes are actually what started the television. The large, heavy tube TVs that we had long ago, you might have one in your basement somewhere, those have cathode ray tubes in them. These are not like your LCD flat screen TVs you have today. The resulting rays of light were manipulated by electric and magnetic fields. The rays always moved away from the negative plate and toward the positive plate. You may remember from previous science classes that opposite charges attract and like charges repel. So if you take a look at our diagram here of a cathode ray tube, we can see that the cathode ray is being bent toward the positive side and it is being deflected away from the negative side. So think about what that may mean for the charge of this cathode ray. The charge to mass ratio of the rays was measured, which was much larger than that of the hydrogen ion, which was the smallest particle known at the time. Conclusions. Because the charge to mass ratio was extremely high compared to the hydrogen ion, the mass of the particles in the ray must be extremely small. So since this value was so high, the mass being in the denominator had to be very small. The particles, which Thompson called corpuscles, were later named electrons. Because the mass of the electron was much smaller than that of an atom, the electron must be a subatomic particle within the atom. The term subatomic means within the atom. So here we're talking about things that are smaller than atoms, they're contained within the atom. Since different metal electrodes produce the same result, all atoms contain electrons. So this is a really important point here. Because Thompson always got the same results no matter what the metal was, it meant that electrons were in all atoms. Since the rays were repelled by negative plates and attracted to positive plates, the charge of the electron was shown to be negative. Since an atom was known to be electrically neutral, there must be positive charge in the atom to counteract the negative. Now to be clear, protons were not discovered yet. We discovered electrons here, and we have to infer by deductive reasoning that there had to be positive to balance out to be neutral. This led to the plum pudding model. Remix! Where electrons are dispersed evenly through a uniform positive sphere. So up until Thompson, we only had Dalton's hard sphere model. So if you look at the top image here, we've got an example of Thompson's plum pudding model. Now in this model, you've still got the same basic shape, except now you have those negative electrons that Thompson just discovered. They're embedded inside of this positive medium. Now the positive is there because it has to balance out all those negative charges of those electrons. So why is it called the plum pudding model anyway? Well, that's actually a British dessert that's actually a cake with raisins in it not plums for some reason. Thompson was thinking that the raisins represented the electrons and that cake represented the positive medium. Now, we don't eat plum pudding here in America, so between all of us, our little secret will be to think of this as the chocolate chip cookie model, where the chocolate chips represent the electrons and the cookie represents the positive medium. It was here in Cambridge that the first clear evidence for smaller objects inside the atom was found. 
Many of the great scientists of history have walked these streets, and one of the greatest was J.J. Thompson, who became the director of this, the old Cavendish Laboratory. In 1896, Thompson had just got his hands on this new piece of kit. Now, it's essentially a particle accelerator. When this plate's heated, particles are emitted. They're accelerated by these electrodes. They pass through these two plates, across which you can apply a voltage, and they hit the end of the bulb here on a screen which glows so you can see the beam. Now this is a modern version of Thomson's apparatus. Again, we've got the particle accelerator and there's a screen in there so you can see the beam glow. Now, what Thomson did was he varied the voltage across the plates and he measured the amount of bending as the voltage changed. That allows you to deduce the mass of the particles in the beams. Now the lightest known particle in Thomson's day was the hydrogen atom. But Thomson found from these measurements that the particles in this beam are almost 2,000 times lighter than hydrogen atoms. Thomson had discovered the first subatomic particle, the electron. The electron was the first discovery of a fundamental particle and it is interesting to realise that more than 100 years later the electron is still, to the best measurements we can do today, a fundamental letter of nature's alphabet. We can use electrons as ways to probe materials and look at the structure in electron microscopes or in big machines like this accelerator behind me. Pretty much all of, of everything we do in the, in the 21st century depends on understanding the properties of electrons. Thomson had discovered that the atom is not the fundamental building block of matter. There are smaller objects inside. So atoms could no longer be thought of as hard, indivisible spheres. But how did the electrons fit inside the atom? Thomson suggested that the atom was something like this muffin, with the negatively charged electrons embedded in a positive body. Robert Millikan, American physicist, 1868 to 1953. His experiment was the oil drop experiment. He used x-rays to charge tiny droplets of oil which then fell through a pinhole and were suspended in the air using electric plates. Knowing the oil droplets mass and density and measuring the voltage required for suspension allowed for the determination of the charge on a single electron. Now looking at this diagram, there's a lot to take in, so let's break it down. If you look at the top compartment, we are spraying oil up there, and as the oil is dispersing through that top compartment, some of the oil falls through the tiny hole. Now when it enters the second compartment, x-rays are used to actually cause the oil to be charged. Now that it's charged, it can be manipulated by the two plates that you see there, positive and negative, and we can get that oil droplet to stay suspended. It is then viewed through the eyepiece that you see on the left. Conclusions. Since Millikan determined the charge of the electron and had Thomson's charge to mass ratio, he was able to calculate the mass of an electron. Since the mass of the electron was extremely tiny, even on an atomic scale, this implied that there must be other subatomic particles. In a series of experiments carried out between 1908 and 1917, R.A. Millikan succeeded in measuring the charge of the electron with great precision. In his experiment, a fine mist of oil was sprayed into the upper chamber with an atomizer. Some of the tiny oil droplets fell through the hole in the upper floor, and Millikan was able to determine the mass of an oil drop from its terminal velocity. Next, Millikan used an X-ray source to ionize gas molecules in the chamber. Electrons from this ionization process adhered to the oil droplets. The oil droplets now carry a negative charge. The negatively charged oil droplets can be halted by adjusting the voltage across the two plates. As the voltage across the plates is increased, the velocity of the oil drops slows. As the voltage is increased further, some drops will begin to move upward toward the positive plate. If the voltage is set just right, an oil drop can be suspended. When an oil drop is suspended, its weight, mass times acceleration due to gravity, is exactly counterbalanced by the electric force applied. The electric force applied equals the applied electric field, E, times the charge on the drop, Q. Since the mass of the oil drop, the acceleration due to gravity, and the applied electric field are known, Millikan could solve for Q, which is the charge on the drop. Millikan found that droplets had different charges, but each was a whole number multiple of a smaller charge, equal to negative 1.60 times 10 to the negative 19th coulombs. Millikan concluded that this was the fundamental unit of charge the charge of an electron. From the charge of an electron and the charge to mass ratio of an electron determined by Thomson using a cathode ray tube, Millikan was able to calculate the mass of an electron. 
The mass of an electron, 9.10 times 10 to the negative 28th grams, is an exceedingly small mass. Ernest Rutherford, Kiwi father of nuclear physics. Kiwi is someone from New Zealand. 1871 to 1937. Experiments. The gold foil experiment. Probably the most important experiment in this particular class. He bombarded positively charged alpha particles at a very thin piece of gold foil, detecting them using a zinc sulfide screen, which glowed when they hit. So if you take a look at this diagram set up here, we have the box that contains our radioactive source of alpha particles. Now those alpha particles are being shot through a very small opening in that box. This kind of makes a particle beam. Now Rutherford took that beam and he aimed it at a very thin sheet of gold foil, which you can see right in the middle. Now all around that gold foil is that photography paper, or kind of like x-rays, where it picks up any detection of any radiation hitting it, like the alpha particles. Most alpha particles pass directly through, while a few were completely deflected back, much to his surprise. So this was a huge surprise to Rutherford because before this we only had Thompson's model, which had negative electrons, which we knew were very tiny, and that positive medium. So there was really nothing there to stop any alpha particles from going through. So Rutherford was very shocked when a few of these alpha particles were actually deflected back. In fact, he said, this was like firing rounds of artillery shells at tissue paper and having one of them bounce back. Conclusions. Since most alpha particles pass through the foil, the atom is mostly empty space. Since only a few alpha particles deflected back, the mass of the atom is concentrated in the nucleus. Now a nucleus in chemistry is just a small, dense center, not to be confused with a nucleus of a cell. Since it repelled positively charged alpha particles, the nucleus must be positive. Now remember, opposites attract and like charges repel. Since alpha particles are positive and they repelled from the nucleus, the nucleus must also be positive. The electrons must reside in the empty space. So we have two atomic diagrams. The pink one should look familiar. This is Thompson's plum pudding model. And the arrows represent the alpha particles. And they're all going through. And this is what Rutherford expected. But remix! The bottom one, the yellow diagram there, is what we observe. We observe most of the particles going through with very few being deflected. This is the nuclear model. Nine years later, Rutherford actually detected the positively charged proton in the nucleus. Now, just to be clear, we want you to know that the proton was discovered by Rutherford. It was not discovered in the gold foil experiment, just the nucleus was. So imagine these tennis balls are the alpha particles. Now, if the atom were as Thompson had suggested, a kind of amorphous blob, then you'd expect the alpha particles to pass right through. And that's indeed what happened to most of them. But to their surprise, they found that around one in 8,000 bounced right back. After two years of puzzling over the meaning of these results, Rutherford realized that in order for the alpha particles to bounce back, they must hit something small and dense. So his new model of the atom was a bit like the solar system, with all the mass concentrated at the center and the electrons orbiting like planets around the sun. Rutherford's alpha particle scattering experiment was remarkably direct and simple and it showed the nature of what the atomic structure is. By the way the alpha particles bounced off the atom, he worked out where the positive charge of the atom lives. Rutherford had come to the astonishing conclusion that most of the atom, and therefore most of what we think of as ordinary matter, is in fact empty space. So if this apple were the atomic nucleus, the electrons would be a kilometre away. James Chadwick. English physicist, 1891 to 1974. So, so far scientists have discovered the electron, the proton, and the nucleus, but scientists could not account for the rest of the mass that was still missing from the atom. So along came James Chadwick, who, who I like to call Jimmy Neutron. His experiment was the beryllium foil experiment. He bombarded positively charged alpha particles at a very thin piece of beryllium foil a neutral radiation was produced. Much like Rutherford, James Chadwick used alpha particles and bombarded them at different metals. 
When he bombarded alpha particles at beryllium, something was produced with no charge, which ended up being the neutron. But how was it detected? Well, when the neutron hit paraffin wax, it released protons, which having a charge, were detected on a Geiger counter. Conclusions? Neutral particles exist in the nucleus of an atom called neutrons. This accounted for the rest of the atom's mass that was unaccounted for. So we still have our nuclear model that was developed by Rutherford, but now James Chadwick has added another subatomic particle to that nucleus, the neutron. So both protons and neutrons are in the nucleus. Now remember, they're very much concentrated into a very small amount of space. A good analogy would be imagining a golf ball on the 50 yard line in a football stadium. The golf ball representing the nucleus and the stadium representing the empty space in which the electrons reside. Well, that's going to do it for today's episode on subatomic theory. It's been emotional. Corpuscles. 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 The particles, which Thompson called corpuscles. No. Corpuscles. Yes. I'm stupid. The particles, which Thompson called corpuscles. Corpuscles? <laughs> muscles. Should we? Corpuscles. Muscles. Corpuscles. The particles which Thompson called corpuscles were later named electrons. Promotional consideration by Bachmanity Capital. Committing fully, committing blindly, without concern of the consequences. But we never off, but we zone to the brick of dawn S-E-I-E-N-C-E -E -E in the hall they call S-Wing You know we never wear a tie Like my homies, boys, two men, it's so hard to say goodbye Like, like this, that, and this, and uh It's like that, and like this, and like that, and uh It's like this You're going in low power mode Plug and chill to the next episode